Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We receive your word written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it, and it will bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Today we're going to share with you on the subject of the Feast of Tabernacles, which is something that we should understand because it is relevant for us in our life and also regarding the end time events that are going to happen. In Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2, it says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, Concerning the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, or these are holy sacred assemblies, which were actual, actually rehearsals, pointing towards what Jesus was going to do, even these are my feasts. These are not Jewish feasts. These are God's feasts. And these feasts are important because they point forth the work of Jesus Christ. There are seven feasts, three feast seasons. First feast season was where Jesus came and he became the Passover lamb on the very day of Passover, taking the sin upon himself. Then the day of unleavened bread, feast of unleavened bread, where he bore away the sin for the three days and the three nights in the heart of the earth. And then first fruits, feast of first fruits, where he was raised from the dead bodily on the exact day of the feast of first fruits to fulfill those first feasts. Fifty days later was the day of Pentecost, the second feast season. Jesus then received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit and sent it into the earth on that very day to fulfill the feast of Pentecost, which was the birthday of the church and the beginning of people being born again and being able to walk in the ways of the Lord, being restored in relationship back to God. We see that those have all been fulfilled by Jesus. The third feast season is the seventh Hebrew month, which is at this time of year. It is not based on the solar calendar. It is based on God's calendar, which is a lunar calendar. And the seventh Hebrew month occurs either in between September to October, depending upon the, how it falls based on the movement of the moon. And we see that at this time of year, this is what we're talking about and where we're at at this point, actually from a lunar calendar standpoint, is this is during the period of the Feast of Tabernacles. So we always like to share this information at this time. There are three feasts in this last feast season. Trumpets, which we've already talked about, which is going, speaking of the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. And then there's the Day of Atonement, which is on the tenth day of the seventh month, which is the Day of Judgment. That is where the high priest had to go in and pour out the blood on the mercy seat in the, uh, on the, tent, in the Holy of Holies on the east side of the mercy seat, which was a covering over for sin throughout the Old Testament, all pointing towards what Jesus would accomplish when he was the one who was going to pay the price for sin and redeem us. At the same time, this is also the day of judgment. And this particular day is the day that there will be the judgment upon the world that has rejected him. And this will happen in the battle of Armageddon, the destruction of all of the wicked who have rejected him in the second coming of Jesus Christ. The third feast of this third feast season is the Feast of Tabernacles, which we're going to be talking about today. The Feast of Tabernacles is important for us to realize because it has significance not only for the work of God in the church in these last days, but also it speaks of the second coming of Jesus Christ and establishing the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And there's also a future fulfillment of that, which is when God comes with a, to come, God the Father comes to tabernacle with us when there's a new heavens and a new earth. All of this is going to happen at this particular time. In Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 33, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. So this occurred on the fifteenth day of the Hebrew seventh month. And it was a seven day long uh, just, uh, time of holy convocation with God. On the first day will be a holy convocation. There will be no servile work therein. Seven days they offer the offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you. Now seven is the number of completion in Scripture, of completion of perfection, and eight is the number of new beginnings. And this will be the new beginning of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ after Jesus Christ comes back. It says you're going to offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It's a solemn assembly. You should do no several work therein. 
These are the feasts of the Lord, which would be proclaimed as holy convocations. And we also see, he talks about down here in verse 39, also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days, and on the first day shall be a Sabbath, the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. You shall take you on the first day of the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. And you shall keep it a feast unto the Lord for seven days and a year. It shall be a statute forever in your generation. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. That your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. This is talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. There is a historical fulfillment. There is a prophetic fulfillment. And there is the fulfillment that Jesus Christ, of course, will accomplish. And there's also a personal fulfillment of this in our life. Now, there's other places where we see reference to this. We see over in Deuteronomy chapter 16. We pick up over here in verse 13, where he says you're going to observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days after that thou hast gathered in thy corn and thy wine. This is speaking of the harvest that comes in. The harvest that came in, the corn harvest, which was of the barley and the wheat harvest, was in the spring. That was in the first feast season. Then the wine, or the wine and the oil, was in the time of the end, at the end of the season, which would be around the seventh month. What this speaks of is the fact that the full harvest will be gathered in. Now, what does that have to do if this is the seventh time, seventh month at the end? Why would the corn be included? Because the corn was in the time of the first month because this is all prophetic of and a revelation of the fact that the complete harvest of God of souls that have come to him during the church age will be gathered in at the second coming of Jesus Christ and we will be with the Lord as we're going to be caught up to meet him. That's what it's all prophetic of. You're going to rejoice in this feast, thou and thy son and daughter and manservant, maidservant, the Levite, the stranger, the fathers, the widow, and those that are within thy gates. It's a great day, time of rejoicing because Jesus is going to come back and we are going to be with him in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. He says again, seven days shall keep a solemn feast unto the Lord thy God in the place that the Lord shall choose because the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thine increase and in all the works of thine hands thou shalt surely rejoice. This speaks of the fact that there's going to be great blessing and increase for those who are walking in the ways of the Lord before the second coming of Jesus Christ. And you're going to rejoice greatly. Three times in a year, he said, all the males will appear before the Lord thy God on the place that he shall choose, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Here they're calling the Feast of Unleavened Bread the first feast season. That's the time of Passover, unleavened, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Feast of Weeks, which is another name for the Feast of Pentecost, what that's referring to. And also the Feast of tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. So here we see this reference to this. It says every man was to give as well. He's to bring an offering at this time, time, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given unto thee. Now we also see that this is called the feast regarding booze. We see it over in Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 8. Over here in verse 14, they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month. Notice they call it the feast of the seventh month. The seventh month is the month that is prophetic of the final work of Jesus Christ in the church and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it was a feast, feast of booths. A booth, what they did was they got these trees and they constructed this temporary dwelling place. It was simply a temporary dwelling place, and it, as it pointed out, that it was Israel's first encampment after they came out of the Exodus out of Egypt, and they were camping in these booths in the wilderness. But you must understand, this is all pointing prophetically to the fact that you and I are in dwelling places right now, temporary dwelling places, which is our physical body, and we're going to have new glorified bodies at the coming of Jesus Christ. And that's what all this is typified, pointing towards in the types. We see another place over in 
Exodus chapter 12, verse 37. Where it says, the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men besides children. Here it talks about how they came from Ramses, which means child of the sun, where they came out of Egypt, the place where there were worshippers of sun and idolatry, to Succoth, which is the word boos, showing again, pointing the fact that you're delivered out of this and you're coming into a temporary dwelling place. This also was typifying the fact that they had come to temporary dwelling places, but where were they on their way to? The promised land where it was going to be a permanent dwelling place. Well, what about us? You and I, again, as we mentioned, we're in temporary dwelling places in this physical body, but we're going to have a new body, a new place that you and I are going to dwell in. Also, we are all dwelling in a earth that is a temporary earth because there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. All of these things are all types pointing towards what is going to happen, and it's very important that we understand the Feast of Tabernacles and all what it points towards. Now, the first fulfillment of this, as far as the beginning, actually, was the birth of Jesus Christ. It's important that you understand John 1, 14. It says, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Who's the Word? Jesus. He became flesh, took on himself a physical body, and it says he dwelt among us. The word dwelt is a word, skenoo, if you notice in the window below, and it means to fix one's tabernacle or to tabernacle or abide. It is the word which actually means tabernacle. And that is telling you, actually, just by the fact that he came to tabernacle among us when Jesus was born. Jesus was not born on December 25th. Jesus was born at the time of tabernacles. How do we know that he was born at the time of tabernacles? Well, we can know this from the scriptures. In Luke chapter 2, we see in verse 1, it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Now, when was the time of the tax? The tax was always at the end of the harvest when the crops had been sold, and so the Romans wanted to get their tax. This is again in the fall of the year, which was either September or October, the Hebrew seventh month. It was never in the rainy season. The rainy season in Israel began in November, and it went through February. And of course, that shows you that it couldn't have been between the time, uh, the time of December 25th, which is a lie. It's not the truth. Everybody had to go be taxed to go into his own city. And so Joseph had to go up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth under Judea in the city of David, which was called Bethlehem. And that was the time of the tax. That's why he was going there, to be taxed with Mary's espoused wife, being great with child. And then, of course, then she was delivered there. Now, another thing is the fact that we, how we know that Jesus was born at this time is because it says she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger. A manger is a stall. A stall for, was held for, held for animals because there was no room for them in the inn. Two things we see here. The manger was a temporary dwelling place which is what? That's what a booth was, all pointing towards tabernacles. Jesus came and he was actually born, not in a normal place, but in a temporary dwelling place, in a manger. Also, there was no room for them in the inn. Why was there no room for them in the inn? Because all, everybody was there, all, all the rooms were taken. Why were all the rooms taken? Because it was the Feast of Tabernacles and everybody had to come in. That again shows you that this is the time of the birth of Jesus. It was at the time of tabernacles. In verse 8, they were also in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. That shows us the fact that the sheep were out in the field with the shepherds at this time. During the rainy season, they would bring them in. They would not leave them out there. Again, another proof showing the fact that Jesus was born at the time of tabernacles. And that is important. That is the beginning fulfillment because what does a tabernacle mean? He come to dwell with us or tabernacle among us. You might say, well, how did we get this December 25th? It was actually changed when Constantine was the ruler. Constantine decided to make Christianity the state religion and he merged the pagans into Christianity. He was a pagan sun god worshiper himself. And the pagans worshiped the sun god who was Tammuz, who originally was Nimrod, supposedly reincarnated, of course that was a lie, but born 
to his wife through an illegitimate conception named Tammuz, and Tammuz is in the Bible, and Tammuz was born on December 25th. That was the day that they would worship the sun god. Well, the pagans wanted to keep their worship of the sun god. So the, the Romans, the Roman Catholic Church that began at that time, appointed that day, December 25th, as the birthday of Jesus. Was it the birthday of Jesus? No. But they appointed it as the birthday of Jesus to coincide with the birthday of the sun god so the pagans would be happy. Unfortunately, the Christians compromised and allowed that to go on at that time. Of course, they were under great persecution. They had just come through a tremendous persecution through the previous emperor, whose name was Diocletian, who caused great persecution, and, and many uh, Christians were killed and, destroyed, and had some tremendous persecution at that time. So it was a very difficult time for Christians in Rome. Now, the next thing we want to look at is at this time in the fall, this is the time of the rains. There were two periods of harvest, and the rains had to come to prepare and to ripen the harvest. Passover and Pentecost were called the spring rains, but also referred to as the latter rains. And then the tabernacles was the former rains, or called the early rains or the fall rains. Why were they called the early rains? Because you have to understand that, that at the beginning of the fall was when they did their planting, and then the rains would come in the spring, which was the first harvest, which was of the barley crop and the wheat crop, and then later on were the end rains, the end time, which were at the time of the seventh month, which was the corn and the, the wine and the oil and all the other things were uh, harvested at that particular time. So there were the early rains and there were the latter rains. Now, this is all important for us to understand because when there was rain, there was blessing. And in Deuteronomy chapter 11, it says <clears throat> down here in verse 10, For the land which thou goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt, from whence you came out, where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with a foot as the, as the garden of herbs. But the land where you go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven. This is all prophetic. Prophetic of the fact that the land I'm taking you in is a supernatural land that's going to be watered from the rain from heaven, talking about a spiritual thing is what it's all a type of, of it's going to bring the spiritual fruit that comes from the working of the Word of God in our life. A land which the Lord thy God careth for. God's going to watch over this land. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it, from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year, because God is always watching over all that is in his land. We see also, it'll come to pass if you shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season. Now notice, here's the condition for them to get rain. It wasn't automatic. If you would, in God's way, you have to obey him for his rain from heaven to come to bring forth his blessing and fruitfulness. If you hearken diligently unto the commandments which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, then this rain comes in his due season. The first rain, the latter rain, that thou mayest bring in the corn, the wine, and the oil. This is all prophetic of the entire harvest that God is going to bring in because the corn, again, was the early harvest, and then the wine and the oil were later harvests. It's all prophetic of the complete harvest that God is going to bring in of souls before Jesus comes back. I'll send grass in thy fields for thy cattle that thou mayest eat and be full, Prosperity comes during this time. Take heed to yourselves that your hearts be not deceived. You be turned aside and serve other gods and worship them. Well, that's one thing. You have to be sure that you're serving God and following after Him. You can't be following after other gods. Then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you if they would turn away from the true and living God and have other idols, other sources. He'd shut up heaven, that there be no rain, and the land yielded not her fruit, lest you perish from quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Otherwise, if they disobey, the rains are withheld. So this shows you that rain is a blessing. You, when you obey, rain comes. When you disobey, no rain comes, and a curse would come. Now over in 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8, we see in verse 35. When heaven is shut up and there's no rain, because they've sinned against thee, that's what causes no rain to come. If they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sins when thou afflictest them, then hear thou in heaven 
Forgive the sin of thy servants and thy people Israel, that thou shouldest teach them the good way wherein they should walk, and give rain upon thy land, which thou hast given to thy people for inheritance. So here, what do we see? If they have sinned and there's no rain coming, what's the answer? Pray, turn from our sins, turn away from them. God will hear, he'll forgive us. And then he says, I'm going to teach you the good way. We need to be taught the way of the Lord to walk in. Very important, we walk in line with his word. And then he will give the rain that will come, bring forth the inheritance, the blessing, all the promises that what God is going to bring forth in our life is what all that's a type of. In 1 Kings chapter 18, down in verse 41, Elijah said to Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there's a sound of abundance of rain. We're supposed to eat something, and we're supposed to drink something. What do we eat? We eat the Word of God as we take the Word into us. What do we drink? We drink in the Holy Spirit. Drinking is taking the Holy Spirit in. It talks about in John chapter 7. So through the Word and the Spirit in us and leading us and guiding us in what we do, we're going to see God bring forth His blessing in our life. He said there's a sound of abundance of rain. This great rain is going to come. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth, put his face between his knees, said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked, and he said, There's nothing. So he didn't see anything. But so he, then he goes seven times. He keeps going, going continually, looking. It came to pass at the seventh time. Now what's that prophetic of? That's prophetic of, first of all, seven is the number of completion, showing the fact that the work of God has been accomplished in the church and now ready for the second coming of Jesus. It also points towards the seventh month, which is again prophetic of the second coming of Jesus Christ. At the seventh time, he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. He said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. Otherwise, there's going to be such a great rain, you won't even be able to go down. It'll be such a, uh, you wouldn't be able to travel. It came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. A great rain was going to come. Now, this great rain, what are we talking about when we're talking about this rain? The rain refers to blessing, but what's going to bring blessing? The Word of God in our life. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 1, it says this, Give ear, O, my, o ye heavens, and I'll speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. What's he talking about? Everybody's supposed to hear the words of his mouth, hear the word of God. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. Otherwise, the rain that it's talking about is the true doctrine, the true teaching of the word of God that has to come to us. Because how does fruitfulness come forth in our life? By hearing and doing the word. Well, how are we going to come to that place? We've got to hear the Word. How is God going to bring this great rain? It's through you hearing and doing the Word continuously so you bring forth fruit and more fruit and much fruit in your life. So he says, The doctrine is going to drop as the rain. My speech shall just do as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb and as the showers upon the grass. This great rain is going to come. Well, we see in Isaiah, in chapter 55. Isaiah Chapter 55, we pick up over in verse 10. He says this, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, again, spiritual revelation, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. What all is this talking about? It's talking about His Word. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It comes like this rain coming. God's word is coming to the body of Christ to teach it, to teach the body of Christ the truth, so that then it can bring forth fruitfulness. My word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto be void, but it shall prosper that which I please, and it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. This great rain is the Word of God that is coming to the body of Christ. And you must understand that this is all prophetic and pointing towards what God is doing in the church age. Because what did Jesus do, as it says in Ephesians chapter 4, after He had gone back to heaven, and it says in verse 11 that He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. That's the fivefold ministry. What's their purpose? 
Their purpose is the perfecting or the maturing of the saints. For the saints to go out, grow up and go, go on into perfection in the Lord, walking in His ways, conquering sin, bringing forth fruit, possessing promises, entering into His spiritual rest. And what's the purpose of the perfecting of the saints? For the work of the ministry. Who does the work of the ministry? The saints do. Every one of you are to do the work of the ministry of preaching the gospel and going forth to minister to others. For the edifying of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is to be built up and edified and become strong. How long is this going to happen? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge, the word knowledge means precise, correct knowledge. So till we come to the unity of the faith and the precise, correct knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, this is the mature man that's come to completeness, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, the man in Christ is going to rise in these last days before Jesus comes back. And that is going to be the perfect man, the church that has gone on and come to perfection, that has conquered sin and has conquered the enemy and is walking in the ways of the word, bringing forth great fruitfulness and going on into holiness, perfecting holiness in their life. We're all, this is going to happen until we come to the unity of the faith and the pertinent, exact, precise, correct knowledge of the Son of God. That shows you the fact that we're not there by any means for the second coming of Jesus because the body of Christ has great problems in it because there is so much false teaching on so many different areas evidenced by all these different doctrinal stands by all these different groups. If the world looks at the church today and they see this group believes this, and this group believes this, and this group believes this, there's a mess. That's not the way it's supposed to be. And that's not the way it's going to be right before Jesus comes back. There will be a falling away, as the Word says, but there also will be a body of Christ that will grow up and come to the unity of the faith and the exact, precise, correct knowledge of the Son of God, to the perfect man, and the, the fullness of Christ will be seen in the body of Christ that will arise in these last days. Another thing that we see in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 16, in verse 15. Proverbs 16, verse 15. In the light of the king's countenance is life, and his favor is as the cloud of the latter rain. The latter rain is the outpouring of this teaching and of the Holy Spirit. It's a combination of the Word and the Holy Spirit in the last days to perfect the church, because what does the rain do? The rain comes to ripen the harvest so that the crops, so that they'll be ready for the harvest. And that's what we see. His favor is going to come as a cloud of the latter rain. There'll be great favor that will be upon the church. Remember in the early church that there was great power and there was great grace or favor upon the church. Same thing's going to happen in the latter church, the end, end times church. There's going to be great power and there's going to be great favor upon the end time church. At the same time, if people will not come in line with his word, they're going to be part of the fallaway crowd. They're not going to be blessed. In Amos chapter 4, we see something important in verse 16. Verse 6. He says in Amos 4, 6, I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, want of bread in all your cities, yet have you not returned unto me. Want of bread, that's lack. Hey, they weren't being blessed. Why? Because of their sin. They hadn't returned unto the Lord. Also, I've withholden the rain from you. The rain got withheld where when there were yet three months of the harvest, and I caused it to rain upon one city, and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon, the piece wherein it rained not withered. Now why would that be? Why would God cause it to rain in one place and not in another? Because of the fact that one is all typifying the ones who are going to walk in line with this word, be obedient. They're going to have the rain, they're going to see the blessings. But the ones who do not hearken to his voice and walk in his ways and return unto him, they're not going to see the blessings and there's not going to be any rain to bring forth blessing and fruitfulness and all the things that God wants to accomplish. And they'll the, be the ones that are going to be in the fallaway crowd. Two or three cities wandered into one city to drink water. They were not satisfied. Yet have you not returned unto me? Even in their time of drought, they weren't returning to God. See, People need to return to God. If we're not seeing God bring forth what He purposes in His Word, we should be returning to Him and seeking after Him to walk in His ways. But they weren't. 
I've smitten you with blasting and mildew when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees are increased. The palmer worm devoured them, yet you've not returned unto me, saith the Lord. That meant judgment was coming, yet they still wouldn't come to the place of repentance. I've sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with a sword, taken away your horses, made the stink of your camps to come up into your nostrils. Yet have you not returned unto me? What do we see continually? You've not returned unto me. He says it again. I've overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet you've not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Therefore thus will I do unto thee, O Israel. And because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God. That means prepare for judgment that is going to come upon them because they would not obey. He says, Lo, he that formed the mountains and created the wind and declared unto man what is his thought that maketh the morning darkness and treadeth upon the high place of the earth, the Lord, the Lord God of hosts is his name. They were supposed to return to God. Without it, judgment was going to come upon them. But for those who will return unto God, there's the promise of great blessing. This is all typifying the ch that what's going to happen in the church in these last days. Like we ought to show you another scripture, first of all. You must understand, before the end comes, which is the judgment upon the nations, 1 Peter 4, 17 says this, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? That shows us the fact that judgment is going to come to who first? The house of God, which is the church, before it comes to the world. So that shows you the fact that there's going to be a time of judgment, which those who are not going to walk with God, they're going to fall away. Those who do, they're going to go on into perfection, great, fulfill, great uh, fruit in their life, and they're going to see God accomplish His mighty work in the end time church to raise it up to be the full man manner of the stature in Christ. Here we see in Joel 1, verse 10 to 12, this is the state that they were in. He said, the field is wasted, the land mourneth, for the corn's wasted, no fruit from that one. The new wine's dried up, no fruit in that harvest. The oil languisheth, no fruit in that. Be ashamed, O you husband, howl, O you vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley. The wheat and the barley was the early harvest, because the harvest of the field is perished. No fruitfulness in their life. He says, the vine is dried up, the fig tree languishes, the pomegranate tree, and the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered. What do the trees of the field typify? The trees are typifying believers, because you and I are to be the trees of righteousness. Trees are typifying believers in Jesus Christ. What happened? They all withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Why did they not have joy? Joy comes from the Word of God in your life and working in your life. How do we know this? We see it from the Scripture. We see over in Jeremiah, in chapter 15, verse 16, look what it says. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. Remember, we're supposed to eat something, eat the Word. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. God's Word in you will produce joy. How's the Word found? Because you're going to spend time in it. You're going to study the Word of God. You're going to learn the Word of God. You've got to learn His ways, which is His reign coming unto you before you're going to bring forth fruitfulness so that you can be coming to perfection and be in that end-time remnant who are going to walk in the ways of the Lord. You, so we've got to get the Word in us. Also, joy comes because when you apply the Word in your life, what's going to happen? As you apply the Lord apply the word in your life. It talks about uh, in John 16, 23, how we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, and we make a demand of what's due us, as the word ask. Making a man of do us nothing in thy name, he says up to this time, but you're going to make a demand of what's due you. You shall lambano it, or take hold of it, that your joy may be full. What else is going to produce joy? Your prayers are going to be answered because you're going to be praying the Word. You're going to be walking in line with the Word. God's going to be responding. You're going to see God delivering you, healing you, restoring you, bringing you out of bondage, bringing forth His blessings in your life. That is the work of the Lord because we are responding to His Word. Now, over in Hosea. Hosea. You see over here in chapter 6, we see something important. 
Here it speaks about, come and let us return unto the Lord. That's what God wants. He wants us all to repent and return unto him. Then he says, after two days. What's two days? Two days is a type of the thousand years of the time of Christ, the 2,000 years. Two days. After two days will he revive us. And when you think about it, when did the time of the church begin? It began at the time of 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When was that? That was 30 A.D., wasn't it? 30 A.D. was the time when Jesus died, died on the cross and was raised from the dead. 2,000 years from that is 2,030. Are we there yet? No. Are we getting close? We're on the way. There's going to be a mighty work that's going to be done. Another reason why, don't think that Jesus is going to come back any moment. All these people that are teaching the imminent return of Jesus don't know what they're talking about. If they understood the scriptures, they know we're not even to that point yet. The 2,000 years is not past yet. After two days, that means, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up. And this is talking about right at the beginning of the third day, he's going to raise us up and we're going to live in his sight. That means he is going to raise the body of Christ mightily up and they're going to walk in his ways and they're going to live in his sight. That means they're going to be totally focused on him. They're not going to have other gods before them. They're going to be walking in his ways. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, meaning you're going to, get to, you're going to come to the place of knowing him. You're going to know him intimately and personally in your life. His going forth is prepared as the morning. And how's he going to come to us? He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain unto the earth. He's going to come as the rain. How's the rain? What's the rain? The Word of God, the teaching of the Word of God that is going to come to us. He's going to come to us as the latter and the rain, this great shower, this great rain that's going to come to bring the true doctrine of Jesus Christ, to establish the body of Christ in the truth. So not all the splintered beliefs, you know, supposedly a church that's got all these different doctrines. No, they're going to come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. This is what all this is prophetic of. So as we go on to know the Lord, the latter and former rain is going to be poured out and we are going to see that we're going to come to that place of fruition and maturity in the Lord. Praise God. Now, we see something else over in Psalms. Psalms 65. And this is all important for you to understand what tabernacle is all about. Because remember, when we talk about tabernacles, are we keeping some Old Testament thing? No. This is all revelation of the reality and the spirit of what Jesus is doing in the body of Christ and about the second coming of Jesus. That's what it's all typifying and pointing towards. And that's why we're teaching you this, which is important. Psalm 65, verse 9. Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God. The river of God. Remember, we're not just having a little bit of drops here and there. We're having showers. And what showers are going to produce? They're going to produce rivers. River of God, which is full of water, thou preparest them corn when thou hast so provided for it. That's talking about, again, bringing the corn to the place of being ready for the harvest. So the river of God is coming. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly, thou settest the furrows thereof, thou makest it soft with showers, thou blessest the spring, springing thereof. As this showers and this river is coming, what's going to happen? It is going to bring great blessing, as it says. Blessing is going to come. And this is all tied into tabernacles, as you see, because Psalms 44, verse 4, says this. There is a river. A river is coming. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. What's the city of God? The city of God is a type of the church. The city of God is the church. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High God. Where is God coming to dwell? Remember where he's coming to dwell in these last days? He's coming to dwell in us. How do we know all that? Remember what it talks about over in Ephesians in chapter 2, where it talks about beginning from verse 18 and, or 19 and following, where it says, We're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. Who's that talking about? The church. 
is going to grow into the holy temple of the Lord. That means you're not going to be walking in sin. You're not going to be in the ways of the world. You're not going to be in compromise. You're not going to have one foot in the world, one foot in God. You're not going to be carrying on the works of the flesh. You're going to be walking in the spirit in holiness, be a holy temple in the Lord. You also are builded together for a habitation of God through the spirit. In other words, God is coming to dwell in the church. A habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, you must understand, before Jesus comes for the church, He's coming in the church. And this is what He's going to do in these last days. You're going to see that He's going to come in the church to see who's going to follow Him and who's not going to follow Him. Deuteronomy 23, 14 says, for the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp. The camp is a type of the church. Before he comes for the church, he's coming in the church. To do what? To deliver us. To give up thine enemies before thee. He wants you to get delivered from every work of the enemy, every evil spirit's act in your, in your life. Therefore shall thy camp be holy. That's the church. You're going to be holy. Because what type of a church is Jesus going to present to himself? Holy, without blemish, without spot, unrebukable, unreprovable without blame. The church has got to be holy before he's coming back. And he's going to bring that forth. That he see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. Otherwise, you can't have any uncleanness in you. In fact, the word unclean really means, it means nakedness. And when would you be naked if you don't have God's clothes on? Remember, we clothe ourselves with the things of God, with the armor of God, with all the things of His clothes, with the armor of the robe of righteousness, and all the things that God has, His garments. So as you put on God's clothes through the Word of God, and you walk in the ways and get delivered from all evil and become holy, then God will not turn away from you. Instead, He'll manifest. Is God going to manifest Himself in a church that's not holy? No. It is not going to happen. That's why you don't see the presence of God manifest mightily in the church. You will see it down the road when the church comes to the place of perfection in the Lord. We see something else that's going to be important if you're going to see this great work of God be accomplished in you and what will happen in the church. Because not only does this have a prophetic fulfillment, this also is all relevant to every one of us today. God wants this total work to be done in us, so we are come to fruition. We are holy. We are being fruitful. We're come to maturity and perfection in the Lord and walk in holiness ourselves. Jeremiah 5, 24, he says this, Neither say they in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God. What this is talking about, where the people were revolting and they were rebellious to God. And they said, Neither say they in their heart, the rebellious ones, Let us now fear the Lord our God, which would be the right thing to do, of course that giveth rain, both the former and the latter. What's the former and the latter? That's talking about the end time harvest. That's the top that's going to happen before the coming of Jesus in the church. Both the former and latter in his season, he reserved unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. The point being is this. Those that are going to see the rain are those that are going to have the fear of God before them. When you have the fear of God, the fear of God is to hate evil. The fear of God, by the fear of God, men depart from evil. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge and the beginning of wisdom. Without the fear of God, you'll abide in the areas of your sins. You'll continue to walk in the ways of the flesh. But when the fear of God is before you, you will turn away from everything that's evil. You will hate evil, and you will walk in the ways of the Word of God and be a hearer and a doer of His Word. Also, in Jeremiah chapter 31, over here in verse 10, Hear the word of the Lord. O oh, ye nations, declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that gather Israel, scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, and ransomed from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord for wheat, wine, and oil. What's that? That's the combined harvest, the latter and the early and the latter harvest that's going to come. And for the young of the flock and the herd, their soul shall be as a watered garden, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Again, what's God coming to do? He's coming to bring His rain, His water, His showers to us, so that what happens? We become fruitful. How's He doing that? Through His Word. And what's going to happen? You're going to be fruitful. You're going to be victorious. You're going to be blessed. Are you going to have any more sorrow anymore? No. 
You're going to come into the place of no more evil. You're going to walk in His ways. You're going to be healed, delivered. You're going to come to the place of joy, great joy, because this, this feast is all about great joy and deliverance and victory and liberty coming forth for the body of Christ. This is not only going to happen, of course, when Jesus comes back and, and we're delivered from all the evil people, they're going to be judged, but also this is prophetic of what He's going to do in the body of Christ before He comes back, and that is important to see. So the virgin will rejoice in the dance, both young men and old. I'll return their mourning to joy, comfort them, make them rejoice from their sorrow. There's going to be joy. And he goes on and says, I'll satiate the soul of the priest with fatness. You and I are priests. Satiating is something just overflowing with just absolutely in, in, in build up to the, above the, the level of, of your top of your head. Just that you're going to be just totally engulfed in the uh, so the fatness of the Lord, and the people will be satisfied with my goodness. That's God's great blessing that's going to come. We even see this further in Joel. We saw in Joel the state of the people that when they were, uh, uh, joy had left them and they weren't walking right in chapter 1. But now we're going to look down what's going to happen when God is going to manifest himself in the church to bring it to maturity. In Joel chapter 2, verse 21. He says, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. That's right. He's going to do great things in you and in the body of Christ. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree, who's the tree a type of? You, the believer, beareth her fruit, the fig tree and vine do yield their strength. You're going to become the place of bringing fruitfulness and great strength in your life spiritually. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he'll cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first. The month is not there in the first, he's talking about. Now, there's something we need to see here. There's a mistake here in the King James because they didn't translate things correctly. When I put the cursor over the word former rain, this is talking about the teacher Literally is what it means. It refers to teacher here. The former reign is the teacher. Moderately should not be translated moderately. It is the word which means righteousness. Proof of that is look at how the uses of it. 157 times this word is used in the Hebrew. 128 times righteousness. 15 justice. 9 right. 3 righteous acts. 1 righteously. Every single thing has to do with righteousness. One place, moderately. Who knows why? Because they just didn't understand it. They just figured that they were just going to throw in some word for it, I guess. But that, there's no reason for that to be translated that way. What it talks about is, I've given to you the teacher reign, essentially, of righteousness. Young's brings this out. Young's was so good because he was literally teaching, writing things, and translating things correctly. Notice he says, For he hath given to you the teacher for righteousness. What's going to happen? The true righteousness of God is going to be taught through the word of God, the word of righteousness, and it's coming. That's this, first, this former reign. The reign that's going to come is the word of God that is going to teach you. And it says he'll cause to come down for you the rain. This word rain means a shower. This isn't little drips. It's going to come down like a deluge. A shower is coming. The former rain and the latter rain. The former rain is the teacher rain. The latter rain is what ripens the crops so that then there will be the harvest that will come forth. And this is what is going to happen. The Lord's going to do great things. The church is going to bear fruit because the teacher rain is coming of righteousness so that the body of Christ will come right. Not all this false teaching, but the true teaching. And the floor shall be full of wheat. What's that? That's the first harvest. The fats shall overflow with wine and oil. That's the end time harvest. This refers to the full harvest that is going to come in the church as it's be raised up to the fullness of Christ in the latter days. He's going to restore to us all that's been restored, or destroyed, all that the coca, locust, cankerworm, caterpillar, palmer worm has accomplished. He's going to restore everything. You're going to eat in plenty, means God's prosperity. You're going to be satisfied. You'll be satisfied with Jesus. You're never going to be satisfied with the lust of the flesh. They never satisfy. You're going to come to the place where you don't even walk in the flesh ever. You're going to walk in the spirit all the time. 
praise the name of the Lord, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. What's that prophetic of? When are you ashamed? The Bible says when your enemies triumph over you, you're ashamed. Otherwise, you're not going to be ashamed anymore because you're going to triumph over your enemies. They're not going to triumph over you anymore in your life. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God and none else. What's that a prophetic of? You're going to know God. And God's coming in the midst of you, remember, to bring you to the place of holiness so that you're going to be, come to the place of walking in Him. And you're going to have no other gods before you. We saw that earlier. You can't have any other gods before you. You're not going to see any blessing. God's going to be your total source. And my people shall never be ashamed. He says it again, which means you're going to triumph over your enemies. Then it says, after, after, shall come to pass afterward. This is after the body of Christ comes to this place. There's going to be an end time outpouring of the Spirit mightily. It come to pass afterward that I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Young men shall see visions. This will happen in the end time church that has come to maturity and grown up in the things of God. Also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days I'll pour out my Spirit. Great pouring of the Holy Spirit. Remember, we're eating, which is the Word, and we're drinking, which is the Holy Spirit is going to manifest himself greatly. Because remember, he said out of, the, out of the belly is going to come rivers of living water. It's all going to come. And so he says here that he's going to pour out his spirit. He says, I'll show wonders in the heavens, the earth, the blood, fire, and his pillars of smoke. This is end time events that are going to be happening at the same time when the world is shaking and things are going crazy in the world. As the world's going crazy, the earth, or the church, is going to become lighter and brighter and victorious and blessing and glory is being poured out simultaneously at the same time. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. That's the day of judgment. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, because there's going to be deliverance for the body of Christ. For in Mount Zion and Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Remember, we talked about the remnant. Who is the remnant? Those are the ones that are faithful. Those are the ones that follow him and walk with him. We brought a message on that recently. The remnant are those who are walking in his ways, not the fallaway crowd, but the ones that are going to go on into maturity in the Lord. God is going to bring this forth. You must also understand, talking about this revelation of the word coming forth, we see in Deuteronomy in chapter 31, in verse 9, it speaks of when Moses wrote the law delivered to the priests of the sons of Levi that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the elders of Israel, that he commanded them, saying, at the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release in the Feast of Tabernacles. What's this all? It's all type of the word that's coming to the church that here in the year of release in the, uh, in the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel is to come and before the Lord thy God in the place he shall choose, what was supposed to happen? What's supposed to happen at the time of Tabernacles? What's supposed to happen in the end time church, which is what this is prophetic of? They're going to read the word, read the law before all Israel in his hearing, gather all the, gather the people together. They're going to all come together as one, men and women, children, stranger within the gates, that they may hear. You're going to hear God's word, the real word, not some watered down thing, not some seeker sensitive word, but the real truth. And we're going to learn and we're going to fear the Lord our God and we're going to do all the words of this law. In other words, God is going to bring you and me, and we are to come to this place now to hear the word, learn, have the fear of God before us, and be a doer of his word. And that the children which have not known anything may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land, whether you go over Jordan to possess it. So we are now going to come to this place of receiving this great work of God through the word of God in us. We also see something else over in John. John chapter 7. This is also known as the outpouring of the waters. We see in John chapter 7, verse 2. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. Feast of Tabernacles at hand. 
So that, you know, now we've got to pay attention because this is all talking about end time church fulfillment before Jesus comes back. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples may also see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. They're sitting there telling him. Neither did this his brethren believe in him. Then he says, Jesus said to him, My time is not yet come, but your time is all always ready. Talking to the believers, they're always ready to go in. But Jesus says, My time is not come yet because he's talking about the Feast of Tabernacles and him coming to manifest what it's all prophetic about. He goes on in verse 8 and he says, Go ye up into this feast. They're supposed to go into the feast. All of us are to go into the feast. It's talking about the experiential work of God in our life to come to maturity. That's what it's all typifying. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time has not yet come. Oh, it wasn't time for Jesus to come. He's not coming back until the end until the last day church when he's going to come in the church before he comes for the church. Now what's going to happen as he comes in the church? His time's going to come. When he said these things, he abode in Galilee. And then in verse 10 it says, When his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. What does that mean? That means... It's prophetic of when Jesus is coming. Remember, we shared with you, he's coming in the church before he comes for the church. How is he going to come in the church in these last days? His judgment's going to come to the church first, remember. Not openly, not like, oh, he's here, he's here, all these things happening. You know, these people say, oh, this revival's over here and all these things. They all filter out, you know, just go away, and they don't continue, do they? How is he coming? As it were, in secret. He's going to come to those, not openly, but he's going to come to those who are going to be receptive to the Word of God and allow the work of God to come forth, as it were, in secret. He's coming in to find out whether you and I are going to walk in line with the ways of the Word of God. And we come down to verse 14. Now about the midst of the feast, not at the beginning, but the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and he taught. What well, we mentioned to you that's coming, Jesus is going to be teaching the truth. We're going to see it on a whole, uh, God is going to raise up those who are going to teach the truth in these last days that are going to bring forth the maturity of the body of Christ to the unity of the faith and the precise correct knowledge of the Son of God. And all the other crowd is going to be a fallaway crowd. They're going to walk contrary to the ways of God. So about the midst of E comes up, and he's teaching them. And what's he going to be teaching them, he says? Notice what he says. In fact, they were amazed that he knew all the things that he knew. This is something that's important. John 7, 16 says, Jesus answered and said, My doctrine is not mine, but he that sent me. So what's he doing? He's bringing the true teaching from the Father. He said this, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Now, when you read this in the King James, you lose something that's very important for the revelation of what this is talking about. The word will is the main verb here in this initial phrase because it happens to be a subjunctive mood. It's a main word. The word do looks like it's just a helper, like or will is a helper with will do, but no, that's not, not good because the word do is actually an infinitive. It's not a part of the main verb. An infinitive is translated to something, to do something. It would be to do. That's why Young's brings it out. If any man may will to do his will, that brings out something very important. Because remember, this is prophetic of Jesus teaching the truth to the end time church that it's going to grow up and go on to perfection and maturity in the Lord. And he says, I'm going to bring, he's bringing the true doctrine. That's the doctrine that the reign, the teacher of righteousness reign that's going to come. If any man will to do his will, otherwise, who's going to know of the true doctrine? The ones that are receiving it with the attitude that I'm going to take it and do it and put it in operation in my life. If he wills to do. Those people just want to get knowledge, just to get knowledge. And they're not going to do it, they aren't going to get revelation. 
In other words, the only way you can approach God in the right way when you hear the word is to receive the word and be ready to take hold of it, to do it and put it in operation in your life. If you're just hearing it just to get some knowledge and some understanding and you're not going to apply it in your life, you're not going to get the true teaching of the Lord. You're not going to ever come to the place of the truth. In fact, we'll come back here in a moment to this verse because we see a scripture over in John 3, 21 that confirms, it says, He that doeth truth cometh to the light. If you're not a doer of truth, you'll never come to the light. Those that are hearers, remember, hearing and hearing, but didn't do the word, they built their house on sand and they got wiped out. Only the hearers and the doers of the word consistently are the ones who built their house on the rock and the storms did not shake them. The point being, who's going to be the ones that are going to grow up? This is what you're to be today and what the end time church will be that's going to be a part of the remnant that are going to arise to maturity, the full man of the stature in Christ. And they're going to see the glory of God poured out. The ones that will to do his will. He shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether it be of myself. You're going to know the truth because you are ready to do the word and apply it in your life. He goes on and says, He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. These guys that are speaking of themselves and talking about what they're doing and pastors out there talking about all the great programs they have and all these things and sharing all this stuff, exalting themselves, speaking of themselves, they're in trouble. They seek their own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, all they want to do is get the truth into the people so that they'll grow up in the ways of God. The same is true and no unrighteousness in, is in him. That's why we don't want to speak of ourselves. We're only going to speak the word of God because we want to bring the truth and no unrighteousness be in us because we're seeking for the glory of the Lord to be manifest. At the same time, you must realize that there's going to be persecution that is going to come as you're taking hold of the truth from the crowd that doesn't want, doesn't, isn't going to believe the truth. Like the crowd that doesn't want to believe that casting out demons are for today, or doesn't want to believe that speaking in tongues is for today, or doesn't want to believe that they have to walk in the fear of the Lord and holiness before the Lord. They think they can just do whatever they want to do. No, oh, those guys will persecute you. That's right, and they do. John 7, 28, Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, You both know me, and you know whence I am, and I'm not come of myself. But he that sent me is true, whom you know not. But I know him, for I'm from him, and he has sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. Otherwise, they wanted to persecute him. They wanted to get him, but they could not get a hold of him. Now we come to verse 37. In the last day, the great day of the feast, what day is that? The eighth day. Remember there were seven days, and then there was the last day, which is the eighth day of tabernacles. Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Remember what we saw earlier? The guy's going to eat and he's going to drink. We're going to eat the Word of God and we're going to drink in the things of the Holy Spirit. This is all talking about the Holy Spirit. How do we know? We see it says, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This he spake of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit which they that believe on him, all believers, should receive, lambano, take into them. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is talking about those who receive the Holy Spirit. What do we have in the body of Christ today? We've got a big problem. The majority of Christians are just born again, and they haven't received the Holy Spirit. They think they got the Holy Spirit when they were born again. They got the whole package, but it's a lie. Instead, they got the Spirit of Christ because they have not understood the difference between the Spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ comes from Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes from the Father. First you get born again getting the Spirit of Christ, then you receive the Holy Spirit who comes to dwell in you. Well, all these guys that don't receive the Holy Spirit, they're going to be in trouble because they're not going to have rivers of living water coming out of the inside of them. That's only going to come from the Holy Spirit. That's why you need to receive the Holy Spirit. If you haven't received the Holy Spirit yet, you need to receive the Holy Spirit. And remember, it's after you're born again. And he says, you're going to flow rivers. What's this rivers? What's That's all the result of all this water that's coming, the showers. But it's coming into you, remember? And it's going to bring forth fruitfulness. It's going to bring forth power. It's going to bring forth strength. It's going to bring forth great favor, as we saw. Great grace is coming upon you. God's going to manifest himself mightily in the end time church. 
and there's going to be rivers of living water that are going to flow forth. What do we see? These rivers that are going to come. Remember, we mentioned about these rivers over in Psalms 46. We looked at this before, but just to bring this up again before you, in verse 4, the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles, there's a river, the streams were ever going to make glad the city of God. That's why there's going to be such great joy. You're going to be walking in the Word of God and in the power of the Holy Spirit, manifesting mightily with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in these last days. You're not going to be ashamed anymore. You're going to be have great fruitfulness. Think of all these scriptures that we've already looked at and how they all tie together. The holy place of tabernacles. This is all fulfilled in the end time church. And what's going to happen here? Ezekiel chapter 47. Afterward, he brought me again into the door of the house. Behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the for forefront of the house stood uh, toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. The house is a type of the church. You and I are the house of God. He brought me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me away about the way without unto the utter gate of the, by the way, and look at the eastward, and behold, there ran out waters on the right side. Waters were starting to come everywhere. When the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits and brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the ankles. Hey, these waters are coming. These waters just didn't a little bit. They're now coming up to the ankles. That shows you what God, God's going to bring forth. His water, His teaching of righteousness, His Word of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit. All the water and the Spirit are going to come, and they're going to come mightily into the body of Christ. And they're not just going to come up to the ankles and stop there. No, no. When he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters, the waters were to the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through waters, and they were to the loins. Hey, they're growing and increasing. After he measured a thousand, it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. In other words, the waters are going to engulf you like a river. Then he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. When he returned, behold, the bank of the river, there were many trees on the one side and on the other. Well, who are the trees? It's all a type of you and me, believers. Then he said unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country and go down to the desert and go down to the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. That's right. And he said, It will come to pass that everyone that liveth, that moveth, whithersoever the rivers shall come. And where are the rivers coming? Coming out of you and me, because we're going to be filled up with a river of water shall live. Every place the river comes is going to bring life. And there'll be a very great multitude of fish. What's that? The great harvest of souls. Are we supposed to be, what are we to be? Fishers of men. Hallelujah. Because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed and everything shall live, whether the river cometh. Wherever the river comes, it's going to destroy the works of the enemy and bring healing and bring salvation. And people are going to come to the Lord. But you've got to get the river in you first. If you don't get the river in you, there'll be no rivers to come out of you. See, we've got to get ourselves full of the Word, full of the Spirit. He says, It'll come to pass that the fishers that stand upon it from Engedi and Eglam, they shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds as the fish of a great sea, exceeding many. That is the great harvest of souls that is going to come in before the end comes. You are to be a part of that church. The Mari places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. Those are the ones where they're not walking, and they're, the water doesn't touch them because they have, they've resisted the things of God. They should be given to salt. The river upon the bank thereof, on this side, on that side, shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaves shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters that issued out of the sanctuary, who's the sanctuary? You are. You and I are the sanctuary of God. And the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. In other words, everything that comes out of you is going to be like food, spiritual food for people, because you're going to be given the word to them, and you're going to be given the medicine, the healing. Medicine means healing, which is going to be by the word of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit that's going to flow out of you, and it's going to bring forth great harvest, salvation, healing, deliverance. What happened to the early church? That's exactly what was upon the early church with the outpouring. What's going to happen to the end-time church? The end-time church 
is the one that is going to see this double portion that's going to be poured out. One last passage of Scripture before we stop for this morning. It's over in Hagehi, and we see here where we'll pick up in verse 10, or go back a couple. This is the case where God said to him, Consider your ways. Why was he saying that? Because they were dwelling in their own houses, and God's house was lying waste. That's all a type of people that were living their life after the flesh, getting their own needs met, you know. Just like the guy says, we got our goods, we got our money, we got everything. But he said, you're miserable, you're, you're, you're wretched, you're, you're poor, you're, you know, you're a mess spiritually, is what he was talking about. He said, consider your ways. You've sown much and bring in little. Hmm, that means God's blessing isn't on it. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe but there's none warm. You earn wages, earning wages, but you put it in bags of holes. Otherwise, my prosperity just seems to flaw, go away. Everything, just I'm not being blessed. Consider your ways. What was the problem? He said, you're going to bring, go to the mountain, bring wood, and build the house. It's all a type of building the spiritual house of God in you. I'll take pleasure in it, and I'll be glorified. He'll be pleased when you do the right thing. He goes on and says, You look for much, and lo, it came to little, and when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because mine, mine house is waste, and you run every man into his own house. I mean, they were living a selfish life, living after the flesh. You can't live after the flesh and live a selfish life and think that you're going to get anywhere with God. No, you're going to go nowhere. Therefore, the heaven over you stayed from dew, no blessing. Earth stayed from her fruit, no fruitfulness. Drought upon the land, corn, wine, oil, no fruitfulness, no harvest whatsoever. Everything is a mess. Then he says, Zerubbabel, the son of Jetiel, the Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people. It's really a type of, you think about it, Zerubbabel, the son of Jetiel, would be like a type of the father, and Joshua, the son of the Josedek, Josedek the high priest. And who's the high priest in the end, end days in the church? Jesus. <clears throat> and who's going to be listening to him? The remnant of the people. Who are the remnant? The remnant that are eating and drinking, eating the word, drinking the word. And they want let Jesus come in. They're cleansed. They're coming up <clears throat> and they're growing up in the things of God, going on to perfection. They're the ones that are doing his word. What they do? They obeyed the voice of the Lord. God's going to bring you to the place of absolute obedience to him and to the words of the Haggai, the prophet. And the people did fear before the Lord. Obedience and the fear of the Lord is going to come. And he says, I am with you. God will be with those that obey him and have the fear of God. And he stirred up them again. And it said, he's the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And what did the remnant of the people all do? They came and did work in the house of the Lord. What are you going to do? What is the body of Christ going to do? You're going to be in doing work in you, the house of the Lord, to be built up, to come to the place of doing everything that God says so that you are going to be the manifestation of Jesus in you. You're to become like him. Praise God. You're not, going to, you're not going to be walking the ways of the world or the ways of the flesh whatsoever. In fact, you need to get out of it right now if you haven't. And so here, we come down now to the chapter 2, verse 1, in the seventh month. And what's that? That's this end time prophetic Talk, talking about the end time church in the last feast season in the one and twentieth day of the month. What day is that? Remember, there were seven days, 15th to the 21st day, and then there was the great day. This is the end before the great day, the eighth day. This is the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles. This is talking about what's going to, where, where is the church going to come at the completion of the work of God in the church, which is what Tabernacles is typifying, before the eighth day, which is the day of the new beginnings when Jesus manifests the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. What's going to happen here? He speaks here to the residue, which is also the remnant. Same thing, the remnant of the people, it's the same word, saying, who's left among you that saw this house in her first glory? Talking about the early church. They had glory. Is anybody around from there? No. How do you see it now? How do you see this house, the church? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Absolutely, the church is zip compared to what the early church was. Yet now be strong, O Jezebel, and strong Joshua, strong all ye people of the land, that's every one of us, and work. So what do we see we're supposed to do? We're to be obedient, 
We're to have the fear of God. God's going to be with us. He says, be strong and get to work on working out your own salvation, building the house of the Lord in you. According to the covenant, the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, a type of the world, so my spirit remains among you. Fear not. Don't be afraid of all the things that are going on around you because it's going to be crazy out there. You see what's happening now? It's starting to get kind of crazy. It's nothing compared to what it's going to be. The things that are coming on the earth are going to be so crazy and wild and nuts that people are going to even be dying for fear. Their hearts are going to fail for fear of the things that are coming on the earth. He says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once is a little while, and I will shake the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the dry land. There is a great shaking coming. I'll shake all the nations. Every nation is going to be shaken. And the desire of all nations shall come. This really speaks of Jesus, what is, what is precious or pre to, the, to the nations. What they need is going to come to them because this is all prophetic of the fact that the gospel is going to be preached in all the world for a witness before the end comes. And what's he going to do? He's going to fill this house. What house? The remnant that are obedient, that walk in the fear of the Lord, that are doing the work of God and becoming strong. I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. That's the end time church. The silver's mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. That refers to the end time transfer of wealth that's going to come into the hands of the remnant for the propagation of the gospel. That's what's going to happen. And then he says, the glory of the latter house, there's going to be a glory on the latter house, shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace. They're going to have peace. They're going to come to the place of great glory in the latter house. And that is what is going to come to the church. As we come to that place, what's going to happen? We're going to remember the, the water is going to get to the place where we're like a river. And we're going to be bringing the fish in by the multitudes. And people are going to be healed. Wherever the river coming out of you is going to go, it's going to cause people to live. You're going to be healed. They're going to be set free. The mighty work of the Lord is going to come because you're going to be a river filled with the glory of God and the Word of God. You're going to eat and you're going to drink the Word and the Spirit. And you're going to come to that place. And we're going to win the souls in the midst of all the havoc that's coming on the earth. And what's going to happen then? Jesus is going to come. He's going to come in the clouds. And what is he going to do? He says in Ephesians 5, 20, well, 26 says he's going to sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word. That's the church. That's what he's doing first to get them sanctified and holy and cleansed. Then he's going to present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. That is the church that is going to be presented to Jesus when he comes. When Jesus comes back, the church will be full of the glory of God. They will be without spot, wrinkle, without blemish, holy, unrebukable, unreprovable. And the church is going to be presented to him. It's going to go out as a glorious church, full of the glory of God, walking in holiness. That is what is going to happen. Is Jesus coming back imminently at any time? No. Quit listening to this lying teaching that's coming from these people that do not even know the Word of God on any of these things. Otherwise, they totally repent and turn away from their lying teaching, just selling them all their books and their tapes and making them multitudes of millions of dollars, which most of them have, from all the things they've done. We've got a major problem. God's going to shake all that stuff and bring all that stuff down because it's all a bunch of lies. I hope you can understand what we're saying today. What God is saying is this is tabernacles. God's coming in the church before he comes for the church. And he's coming like the rain to teach you his ways. And you who are willing to do his word are going to know the truth. And you who are ready to take hold of it, and you're ready to be obedient and to walk in the fear of the Lord and to be a hearer and a doer of his word and carry out everything that he says, you are going to see God's blessing. You are going to see that you're going to grow up and be fruitful. You are going to see that you're going to come to the place of being strong and mighty. You're going to come to the place of seeing great favor upon you. You are going to come to the place where you're not going to be ashamed anymore because you're going to triumph over all your enemies. You're going to get healed. You're going to get delivered. You're going to be fruitful. You're not going to be walking in your own ways anymore. You're going to be totally consumed with the Lord. He's coming in the midst of you. He's going to manifest himself. He's going to be your total God. There'll be none else. You're going to get delivered from everything, and you are going to be a part of that glorious church that's going to reach people with the gospel, 
and living waters are going to flow out of you because you have become a river of God. And that is what he's going to bring into the body of Christ before Jesus comes back. He wants you to get filled like that now. But praise God, it's going to happen before Jesus comes again. This is part one about tabernacles. We've got a lot more to talk about, many things we haven't brought forth yet, which we're going to talk about tonight. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word, bringing the revelation of the Feast of Tabernacles, and I see that I must eat and drink what God has for me so that I grow up in all things, so that I see the experiential work of the Feast of Tabernacles be accomplished in me, so I will be a river of living water. I thank you, Lord, that I, if, if Jesus comes during my lifetime, I'm going to be a part of that glorious church presented unto him. Thank you for your word. I will be a hearer and a doer of it, and it will bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Part two will be tonight, where we're going to talk about many other things that are important. And these two combined bring the revelation of what God wants. And then on Wednesday, we're going to talk about the personal fulfillment of the seven feasts of the Lord in your life and all the things that he wants to do all combined together to see God accomplish his great work because every one of them show a personal application for you in your life. Praise God. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. We'll be hearers and doers of your word. And we thank you for the revelation of this. And we're excited about what you're doing in our life. And we're going to see you accomplish it as we eat and drink in the things of God so that we can be the river of God in these last days. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. God bless. If you need prayer, I want to invite you to come forward. Tonight, 6.30, we continue. Sorry for the buzz. We'll try to see what we can do to get that fixed here before. Have a wonderful afternoon. You are dismissed. If you need prayer, come forward.